Please go outside and... Uh, oh, somebody's leaving. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's the first announcement and then Itzhak wants to give, uh, wants to announce also some something. Yeah, please. Okay. Okay. So I should have said it yesterday. Uh, I know many of you wish to have an opportunity to live in Tel Aviv. So I give you this opportunity. Uh, so I have a few openings for PhD and postdoc position in my group. Uh, start, starting the, this summer. So if you're interested or you know of someone who is interested, please uh, send me an email. The email is here. You probably cannot see what is written here, but I hope that you are capable enough to find my email anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Yeah, thank you. Spread this good news that there are jobs. And uh, now we uh, Continue with the uh, with the talk about projective wheat muller codes revisited by Sudia Kopade. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Alexis, uh, Patrick, uh, CM, for making it possible for me to come here. It's, uh, I've been coming to this place for many years and it's always a pleasure. Uh, I saw the name of the conference, AlcoCrypt, and I thought I should talk something about cryptography, but then I realized that I haven't done anything in close to cryptography for maybe 10 years or so. Then I... <coughs> uh, then I thought, okay, maybe I will talk about Reed Miller codes because you know it's also related to Boolean functions, which is in turn to cryptography and so on. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, I'm going to talk about a variant called the projective Reed Miller codes, uh, which is not very new. It's uh, it was actually introduced about 35 years ago. So, and many people have looked at it. So I'm, I'm it's something that I, I'm. Uh, we decided to revisit recently, and uh, I will tell you uh, why that is a relevant thing to do. Uh, this is also a, a joint work with my current PhD student, Rati Ludani. And uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, I should also say that uh, it, CIRM is probably the right place to talk about uh, this code. Uh, it was really uh, here, uh, uh, you know, that. Uh, this code was uh, discussed considerably. I will talk more about that. And the person who uh, introduced it uh, is sort of one of the founding figures of this institute. He was, uh, I'll mention his name. He was the second uh, director of CIRM for five years, 1986 to 1991. And he's uh, responsible for many things. The library came up in his time uh, and many nice things that you see, including even the nice blackboards and so on. Uh, owes something to the inventor of these codes. So, <clears throat> okay, so let's get started. But maybe uh, we start with something familiar. Everybody knows Reed Miller code. And this is a little bit of history. So the Reed Miller codes, as the name suggests, uh, were uh, due to Reed and Miller. In fact, uh, actually, they were first uh, introduced by Miller uh, in a paper in 1954, and then quickly followed by this other paper by Reed, where he talks about decoding of these codes, and both of them are actually published in September 1954. Uh, in some sense, the name is a misnomer because you know both alphabetically and chronologically it should have been Mueller Reed, but uh, for whatever <laughs> historical reasons, uh, and I think uh, uh, none of them mind minded because actually Reed and Mueller were classmates at Caltech uh, uh, in undergraduate days. And uh, if you're more interested in the history, you should read the lecture of uh, Irving Reed uh, at uh, Golom's 60th birthday conference. Uh, so of course, uh, they worked with the binary field. And rather soon, they, the, the study was extended to sort of more general Reed Miller code or query Reed Miller code. And uh, I cite uh, two initial important papers, one of Kasami Lin and Peterson in IEEE transactions and another of Delsart, Gothels, and McWilliams. By the way, papers of Mueller and Reed uh, were published in this uh, IRE professional groups, uh, transactions of the IRE professional groups. I wonder, does anyone know what IRE is? Everybody knows what IEEE is, I'm sure. 
That's right. IRE was the Institute for Radio Engineers. In fact, uh, it was uh, almost 60 years ago that IRE and uh, AAAA, ASEE, whatever, was uh, merged to form IEEE. So this is a precursor to IEEE. Anyway, so uh, all right. So that's for the history. So now, I, so when I say, so of course, uh, when they introduced it, they called it generalized Reed-Muller code. Okay, and I'm just going to call it Reed-Muller code. So I put generalized in the parenthesis. So what do I mean by Reed-Muller code? So here is a definition. Let us fix the positive integer m and a non-negative integer new, I look at the uh, fq to the power m, or if you prefer, a fine m space over fq, uh, and I list it in some order, p1, p2, etc., p sub q to the power m. Then I take a polynomial in m variables, coefficients in fq, of degree at most new, and simply evaluate it at each of the points of this m-dimensional uh, vector space or m-dimensional affine space. So I get this way, uh, evaluation map, which I denote like this. And the image of this evaluation map, uh, this is obviously a linear map, so the image would be a linear subspace of uh, fq to the power q to the m. Uh, that's what I call a uh, Reed-Miller code. So this is uh, more or less copying from uh, delsart gothels macrillian so, so that's uh, what we shall mean by Reed-Miller code. And there are some simple observations you can quickly make. Uh, this is a non-degenerate uh, linear code. It means it doesn't happen that some coordinate is always zero. For example, you can just look at the constant function one. Uh, the length is already looking at q, q to the power m. Uh, when nu is small, say strictly smaller than the field size, the evaluation map uh, is, is one to one, is injective, uh, because you don't have you know, x to the q to uh, have the same value as x. And uh, therefore, the dimension of this code would be same as the dimension of its uh, uh, whatever uh, codomain. Uh, which is well known to be the number of monomials of degree at most nu in m variables, m plus nu choose nu. Uh, on the other hand, if nu is uh, rather big, greater than or equal to m times q minus one, then this map is surjective. And so the image will be the whole uh, space. So that's uh, <clears throat> not very interesting uh, uh, in any case. So uh, what about, uh, oh, I'm sorry, there is a small typo. Uh, what about the minimum distance? The minimum distance, at least when nu is less than q, is not difficult to calculate because uh, what would the weight of such a code be? It just would be q to the power m minus the number of zeros of f. So it's a, it amounts to asking what is the maximum number of zeros that a polynomial of degree nu can have in fq to the power m. For example, if m were equal to one polynomial of degree nu has at most nu roots, a non-zero polynomial, right? And uh, so this, uh, you can extend it, and this is a, a well-known uh, bound was probably first observed by Ore. Uh, things like this are also called Schwarzschild lemma, et cetera, in, but I think Ore's is much older, so I, I call it Ore's bound. And it says that if you have a polynomial of degree nu, then it has at most nu times q to the power m minus one zero. If m equal to one, this is the usual familiar thing about polynomials uh, in one variable. So <clears throat> not only that, this is, this is a good bound in the sense uh, that uh, you can easily write down a polynomial if I can write next to Zach's uh, email address. So you, if you have, okay. If your nu is less than q or even less than or equal to q, you can find distinct elements, say a1, a2, a nu, and look at this polynomial. This is a polynomial in x1, but you think of it as a polynomial in x1 to xm, and it's clear that for it to vanish, x1 has to be one of the ais, and x2 to xm can be completely arbitrary. So this is exactly nu times q mi m minus one zero, so this is an exact bound, and therefore you have the minimum distance. This, there should be a closing bracket here after this. Okay, what about, but uh, you know, uh, nu can uh, indeed, uh, after, well, after this stage, it doesn't become so interesting because it's uh, this, but up to here, you know, there is a still a big gap between q and m times q minus one. What happens there? Uh, well, this has been worked out by many people. So here are is a sort of a summary of known results. The dimension, so I just, uh, to save space, I call the Reed-Miller code to be C. The dimension is given by this formula here and a somewhat simpler formula. The first one you can find in the book of Asimus and Key. Uh, the minimum distance in the general case is given by this formula. Q minus S times Q to the power M minus T minus one, 
what are s and t, you just write your new as uh, by division algorithm as something times q minus 1 plus a remainder and t and q, s and then uniquely determined by that. You can check that if nu is less than q, this reduces to the previous formula. Furthermore, uh, you can find uh, in this uh, important paper uh, good characterization of the minimum weight code words. What are the uh, uh, polynomials which uh, attain uh, you know, uh, this minimum weight? And uh, you can, if you want a quick check, you can just check that the polynomial I have written down actually has degree uh, uh, you know, nu. It's t times q minus 1 plus s. Furthermore, the duals of Reed-Muller code are also Reed-Muller code. This is one of the advantages of you know, looking at Reed-Muller code, not just for nu less than q, but nu less than or equal to m times q uh, minus 1. Uh, so that's that. Uh, the automorphism group is known. It's a, it's a nice classical group. Uh, it's the affine general group. And uh, another very non-trivial result is that all the generalized Hamming weights of these are known. So the result of Heinen and Pelican. More recently, you have a nice uh, proof of this, of actually even more general fact by Peter Bilen and uh, Mrunmay Datta. <clears throat> so, okay, so you know a lot about this code. This is a really one of the most widely studied code. Doesn't mean we know everything. Tomorrow we are going to hear about the covering radius and that's a big open problem. Okay, now uh, let's, let me come to projective Reed-Miller code. So here is again a, a little bit of history. So, so these were introduced by Gilles Lachaud. Uh, the person I was talking about in the beginning, and uh, were also studied by Sorensen. Uh, so, uh, so the first time they make an appearance in this uh, uh, proceedings of a conference in Kasha, uh, in which was held in 1986, and proceedings published in 1988. Here he just looks at some special cases, and uh, you know, uh, says. Uh, uh, has some small results using understanding of quadrics and so on and so forth. And then he followed it up with a, with a paper uh, <clears throat> in discrete math in 1990. And uh, Sorensen also uh, wrote a paper uh, which was uh, submitted in 1990 and published in 1991. Uh, so I will, I'll, I'll come to this uh, definition of the code in just a minute. But the, now here, it turned out that to, to relate it to uh, you know, for example, questions about the number of zeros of polynomials, the following question is, comes up very naturally. Now, instead of a, a polynomial in m variables, take a homogeneous polynomial in m plus 1 variables, degree exactly equal to nu. Question is, how many zeros does it have in the corresponding projective space? And the natural, so if you remember the answer in the affine case, that was d q to the m minus 1, you would kind of expect the answer in the projective case to be d times pm minus 1, where pm minus 1 is the number of points of m minus 1 dimensional projective space. But turns out that the correct answer is not that, but d q to the m minus 1 plus pm minus 2. Let me, uh, I have not defined pm minus 2. So this was a conjecture of Fassmann, and uh, it, was, uh, it was also proposed here in 1989 in a, uh, in a conference at this uh, venue. And that conjecture, um, Jean-Pierre Serre was in the audience, and I think on the train ride back from uh, Marseille to Paris, he, he, he just uh, worked out a proof and wrote a letter to uh, Misha Fassman. Uh, Sorensen also worked on it and uh, uh, wrote uh, his version of the proof. Okay. And if you want to know more about the story, I have written some kind of a tribute to Gilles Lachaud uh, along with uh, Francois Rodier, uh, who is here, and uh, Christophe Rizenthaler and Misha Fassman. Uh, and <clears throat> you can read about it. Okay. So, uh, what are projective Reed Miller code? Oh, okay, maybe again before I give you the definition, here is another viewpoint. There are finite geometers here. Another way to think of the projective Reed Miller code is that you look at the projective M space. It has the standard uh, Veronese embedding into a big projective space, the so called Neupel embedding. And then you try to study this uh, the image and its uh, sections by hyperplanes or linear subvarieties and so on and so forth. And that really amounts to studying the projective Reed-Miller code. And since I mentioned finite geometry, uh, people have looked at it uh, over FQ, and this is a very nice uh, uh, paper by Bill Cantor and Arnie Schult, uh, <coughs> which talks, uh, has some nice properties of Veronesian. And uh, they have uh, various theorems. So their first main theorem, they say that that's a statement about, uh, this is a paper, by the way, in 2013, about a code whose uh, check matrix column uh, is something whose columns consist of one non-zero vector in each uh, Veronesian point. 
And they make an interesting remark there that we have not been able to find any reference to this code in the literature. It is probably worth studying at least from a geometric perspective. As it turns out, I, if I showed you this uh, paper, this was actually studied essentially uh, 25 years ago. So this uh, code that they talk about is nothing but the dual of the projective Riemann mirror code. Anyway, <clears throat> so let's define projective Riemann mirror code. Uh, uh, so uh, this notation P sub J for me will be the number of points in J dimensional projective space over FQ, which we all know what it is. And I'll set it up to be zero if J is negative. So what you do is the following, you take the projective M dimensional space. Now, of course, points have homogeneous coordinates, which are equivalence classes. And if you want to evaluate actually, well, you need to fix representative. So you can fix representative in some uh, fixed manner. For example, you require that the last non-zero coordinate is one. Then the point is uniquely determined. So take such representatives of points of the projective space. And now take a homogeneous polynomial in M plus one variables of degree nu and evaluate it at each of these points. And <clears throat> then the projective Reed-Miller code is precisely the image of this evaluation. Okay, now um, the analog of what I call simple observations in the Reed-Miller code are these. I just dropped the word simple, maybe some of them are not so simple, uh, uh, though it's, they're not difficult really. That this is again a non-degenerate code, the length is clear, it's P sub M, number of points of M-dimensional projective space. Here, when nu is less than or equal to q, the evaluation map is injective. So again, the dimension is same as that of Reed-Miller code, whereas if nu is big enough, m times q minus one plus one, then the map is surjective. So it's uh, again, not a very interesting code. And uh, whereas if nu is less than or equal to q, uh, what I told you about Fastman's conjecture, uh, that uh, dq to the m minus one plus pm minus two, uh, maybe I'm conscious of the time, otherwise I would have motivated this little bit more. Uh, that will uh, show you that the minimum distance is given by this formula, q minus nu plus one to the uh, q to the m minus one. So this was explicitly, uh, this is really follows as a consequence of uh, the positive resolution of Fassmann's conjecture or the inequality that uh, Serre proved. Very good, and also Sorensen. So I'll, I'll come to Sorensen. Uh, some more properties analogous to uh, Reed-Miller code. Uh, what about the general case? The dimension is given by this formula here, which is, uh, you can find it in the paper of Sorensen. Um, there is also an alternative formula, maybe not so easy to find. Uh, it uh, follows essentially from the work of uh, Mercier and Robert Rollo, uh, that is given by this formula. By the way, those of you who like combinatorics can try to prove that the two formulas give you the same thing. Um, this is an exercise which has been done. I'm not going to do it now. Uh, what about the minimum distance? The minimum distance, now what you do, instead of nu, you look at nu minus one. Again, do your division algorithm, write it as t times q minus one plus s, and the minimum distance is given by this q minus s times q to the power m minus t minus one. You can check that if you look at the case when nu is less than or equal to q, this reduces to the previous formula. Uh, so this was done by Sorensen. So Sorensen actually not only solved Fassmann's conjecture, but um, gave this, uh, looked at uh, projective Reed-Miller codes in general and gave these formulas. Whereas uh, uh, Sayer and in fact Fassmann himself had restricted to nu less than or equal to q. Uh, they, he also calculated the duels of uh, projective Reed-Miller code and showed that they are almost always projective Reed-Miller code except in one case where you need to add the all one vector uh, to, the, uh, to the code. And the Automorphism groups of this is known explicitly. I'm not going to write it down, a little bit complicated. This is done by Bergier. Uh, <clears throat> so, okay, so you know many things. Uh, question comes, what is not known? So here is something which is not known. We, uh, at least as far as I have seen, we don't seem to have a characterization of the minimum weight code words, uh, unlike say in the Reed-Miller case. Uh, in fact, uh, if you uh, have seen says proof, the new less than or equal to q, it will actually give a characterization of those, uh, uh, you know, those hypersurfaces which have the maximum number of points and in turn that will give you a characterization of the minimum weight code word. But what about the general projective Reed-Miller code? And then I s talked about the work of Heinen Pelikan uh, about generalized Hamming weights. Uh, that question uh, is, is still wide open, I would say, in this, uh, in this, uh, context of uh, projective Reed-Miller code. And uh, uh, if you like geometric counterpart, that question just corresponds to saying, 
what's the maximum number of uh, FQ rational point that can lie on a, on a uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> as common zeros of let's say R homogeneous polynomials, each of degree D in M plus one variables. Uh, and <clears throat> for this R to make sense, you require these polynomials to be linearly independent. This exactly amounts to finding the uh, the rth generalized Hamming weight of the code uh, when nu is less than or equal to q. So this is a, I mean, there is uh, this is a question which is more general than the one that Misha Fassman asked. In fact, he himself had made some conjectures together with Boguslavsky, and we had showed uh, some years ago that those conjectures are not true in general. We have new conjectures. We have uh, exact value in many cases. This has been something that. Uh, I've been doing for several years now, actually, with uh, mainly with Murnmay Datta and in last uh, few years also with Peter Bilen. So our, uh, I would say the current state of art is a paper published last year, uh, uh, not too long ago, in Moscow Math Journal, uh, which has a summary of this. I'm not going to talk about it, but I thought I might mention it in passing. Okay. So. Uh, so 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 anyway, so Sorensen's paper has had. Uh, lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of impact. So just a, just a quick, uh, uh, I mean, one way you, you know, want to see something about the paper these days, we just look up math sign it. And I don't know if you can read it, but okay, so this is his original paper. And if you sort of see uh, the entry in math sign it, uh, they just decided to publish a summary, but you can see that it has about 70 citations, which is uh, not so small. So, <clears throat> so lots of people have looked at it and lots of people have done things related to it. Question, why revisit it? Okay, so let me try to. Why revisit projective Reed-Miller codes? After all, they're old. Uh, and why again look at uh, Sorensen's paper? So, uh, Rati and I were trying to sort of look at this paper. In fact, I had asked her to read it. And uh, then uh, while doing that, we realized that maybe his proof has a gap. So, um, so our, uh, to put it a little more politely, uh, that maybe there were aspects of it which I did not understand. And uh, I mean, it's, it's really an issue. I mean, if you are familiar with this paper, uh, you should see page 1569, where he looks at the complement of a hypersurface and then uh, says that you can find some linear homogeneous polynomials uh, having you know, one at P1 and uh, uh, <clears throat> zero elsewhere, et cetera. But that may not be possible because when you have linear homogeneous polynomial, let's say you take one point P1, another point P1, I mean, uh, uh, because they're linear and they're homogeneous, they'll be additive. So if your P3, let's say, is a linear combination of P1 and P2, you can't you know, control its behavior so independently. So some of the things he says, they, they, they have a little bit of an issue. Okay, so that's kind of bad because if you have a classical result which has uh, supposedly proved so many years ago and used by people, uh, you know, it's not so nice that the proof uh, uh, seems to have a gap. So, so that's kind of a bad news. What's the good news? So the good news, okay, <clears throat> uh, is uh, the, the, first of all, the theorem is correct. And not only that, the gap can also be fixed. So we were trying to understand that. And then what we did in the process was to, was to come up with a new proof. Um, of the same uh, theorem of Sorensen, uh, the minimum distance formula, which I have reproduced here. But uh, there was an advantage of doing this uh, that uh, what we did, I mean, I, I don't have time clearly to explain the proof, but for those interested, I'll be happy to uh, you know, uh, share a uh, preprint. <clears throat> what we did essentially was to mimic say, and, you know, uh, and but to, of course, you have to be a little bit careful because this new is uh, can be bigger than Q and so on and so forth. The evaluation map is not injective. So you, you kind of uh, use the ideas of SARE, but also keep in mind uh, the lessons you learn from Delsat, Bothels, McWilliams. So roughly speaking, with that, uh, we could give another proof. And th this proof, however, had the following advantage that we could also give a characterization of the minimum weight code words. So um, let, me, uh, let me explain that. Uh, so this is uh, <clears throat> this is the precise characterization that we prove that the, uh, something uh, a code word of the projective Reed Miller code is a minimum weight code word if and only if it uh, it comes from a uh, comes from evaluation of a polynomial which is uh, kind of uh, a product of uh, I mean which is 
It's kind of like a union of hyperplanes. That's really what it is, but uh, uh, of a specific kind. And if you are familiar with the corresponding results for Reed-Miller code, you will see some similarities. And of course, you see the fact that unlike the Reed-Miller case, uh, this is a homogeneous polynomial of correct degree, t times q minus 1 plus s. Uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, actually, t times q minus 1 plus s plus 1, because you know this uh, division algorithm is for nu minus 1 where you uh, come up with uh, t plus 1 linearly independent uh, homogeneous polynomial which are linear okay and you take distinct elements so um, so that's uh, you know that was the that was the outcome if you like of revisiting projective reed miller code and uh, sort of uh, making sure that the theorem is correct and then we have a new proof and uh, as a dividend uh, this characterization of minimum weight code but i think my time is up so thank you <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Other questions? Yeah. So, uh, are there also similar results on the non homogeneous polynomials? Yeah, that would correspond to the classical Reed Miller code, no? I mean, uh, uh, but what exactly you mean by similar results? That exactly corresponds to the Reed Miller code. See, uh, just as, uh, just as uh, finding uh, generalized Hamming weights of projective Reed Miller code means finding maximum number of zeros of a system of uh, homogeneous equations like this of a same degree linearly independent. The <coughs> Reed-Miller would correspond to just looking at polynomials say f1 x1 to xm equal to 0 fr and uh, you say that the degree of uh, fi is less than or equal okay I called it nu and uh, these are linearly independent. And the question is, what is the maximum number of zeros in the affine M space that such a system of equation can have? This exactly corresponds, well, at least let's, let's assume uh, that nu is less than q. This then is exactly corresponds to finding the generalized Hamming weights of uh, Reed-Miller codes. And that is a problem which is completely solved. It's, it's a fairly non-trivial result. You know, it would use uh, things from extremal combinatorics like kruskal katona et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, okay. Alessandro. So first of all, thanks for the very nice talk. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I was a lot of questions, but um, I select one okay. because of the <laughs> no. So for uh, for uh, what concern the affine case in general, so in an homogeneous case, you can define essentially whatever you want uh, as evaluation map uh, unless you restrict to finite grids. You know? yeah. So like uh, using then the general bound from Allen and uh, Fourier, I guess. And uh, well, in the br I don't see if in the projective case you can do something similar. Maybe is it possible to do some uh, restriction uh, of the map, so the um, which co will correspond to some puncturing, so to, to some uh, uh, special sets of yeah. points uh, in the projective space? Is it possible to do something? Okay, see, I will tell you, I mean, how the bound new times, or, or I said D, I, 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 in various papers I've called it, uh, uh, called it D, but how this bounds comes about. I mean, geometrically, the way you think of it, say you have a hypersurface in M space of degree D, you project it on the M minus 1 space. Intuitively, uh, given a point below, you have D points above, and that sort of amounts to this bound. You would want to do the something similar in the projective case. Geometrically, you have a projective hypersurface of degree nu projected onto PM minus 1. Uh, for a point below, you have nu points above, so you would expect that this is the correct bound. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is a bound, but this is not an optimal bound. Mm -hmm. okay? Because let's say, just like uh, I did here, suppose you try to find a polynomial homogeneous of degree nu, which has the correct number of zeros. What would you do? Natural thing to do would be to homogenize this put x0 here, x0 here. You can try to calculate the number of zeros. See, for example, there are really two possibilities. x0 is 1 or x0 is 0. If x0 is 1, then you are really in the affine space. So you will have uh, exactly as before, uh, nu times q to the power m minus 1. But if x0 is 0 and this polynomial is 0, then x1 is forced to be 0. 
So then you will only have PM minus 2. So you have this. So this is different from nu times PM minus 1. Nu is multiplying every power of Q. Whereas here it's only multiplying the top power. And one really cannot find polynomials which have that right number of zeros beyond that. Mm -hmm. And that's, if you like, a motivation for Fassmann's conjecture. Mm -hmm. And But then it was not obvious how to get this bound, say, geometrically or algebraically. And that's what uh, Sayre proved, Sorensen's proved, etc. And the situation becomes much harder when you have more equations. Yeah. yeah. OK, thanks. Sorry, my English was not good. I said more harder. I should have just said harder. <laughs> Thank you for your, for your nice uh, talk. Yeah. Uh, what do we know exactly on the weights, uh, on the Hamming weights of uh, generalized uh, Reed-Muller codes? In yeah. particular, uh, did people try to generalize the Kasami-Tokura results uh, on uh, twice the minimum distance code words? At uh, most twice. Okay, let me say what I so of course when you when you know uh, minimum distance and minimum uh, characterization of minimum weight code words, you know the first weight so to speak, and uh, <clears throat> people have tried to look at the the second weight and the third weight, and there are some papers I can give you references, uh, and I think even for third weight the results are partial. Second weight we understand uh, better. Uh, and I think, uh, but beyond that, I don't know uh, too many explicit results, I would say. With, uh, of course, the question of, uh, that, that's a distinct question than generalized Hamming weights, right? I mean, obviously, uh, the, the, the spectrum or weight distribution of these codes. And um, my sense is that we don't know much beyond a, um, second weight and partial results for the third weight. I'm sure pe no people did try. There are papers. Uh, I have not worked on that problem myself, but uh, people I have seen people have worked on it. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a nice presentation. So you gave very nice history, by the way. Uh, and I want to ask uh, whether if we can choose polynomials, uh, degree of the that evolution polynomial uh, increasing order. Is there any kind of result uh, for uh, minimum distance of, of different degrees? You mean? I mean. Uh, I will such that allow only polynomial, I mean, variables degree are just increasing order. I mean, this is sub, maybe not the subspace code, but somehow I am picking, evaluating polynomials cleverly so that their degrees are increasing. So See, I think as far as one, these are corresponding symmetric Rittmuller code and uh, do you know any kind of result in this direction? Uh, not really. See, I mean, if you were to allow degrees to be arbitrary, you know, you can always rearrange them so that the degrees are increasing. Then the question really becomes, uh, you know, finding uh, sort of nice explicit degree-based bound for uh, practically every projective algebraic set, which is a little too hard. Uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but people have, have, have sort of looked at, for instance, in this setup, so you're looking at points in fq to the power m, uh, the zeros. Instead of that, uh, they've looked at some, uh, take subsets of fq, a1, a2, am, and restrict yourselves to this and talk about zero. These are what are called affine Cartesian codes. So there are results uh, analogous in that sense, but I, I think I'm not answering your question probably. But, uh, but my sense is that if you allow the degrees to be general and so on and so forth, the question just becomes a little too general to expect a, a good answer. Okay. No more questions then. Thank you again and we continue.